uh, at least an important topic that uh, is coming up more and more. So it's about understanding engineering challenges without an engineering background. Um, and my guess is if people are at product school, there are a lot of people who are already doing product in this room or interested in product. And one of the things that I hear a lot from people who are looking to get into it is, oh, I want to do it, but I, I don't have a technical background. I don't do any engineering. Um, I think I can do all the, you know, all the customer stuff. I think can understand the UX stuff, but the engineering part always gives me a little bit of pause. Uh, and I'm definitely somebody who falls into that camp. So I'm really excited to talk about that um, alternate talk, excuse me, title for this talk, uh, how to be a handsome genius who is good at everything and bad at nothing. Uh, there it is. There's a laugh. That's fun. Uh, and it always hurts my feelings when someone laughs. So thank you so much. Um, but no, I, I'm super psyched about this. In terms of my background, um, I kind of think about my background in two ways. On one hand, I sort of have kind of a traditional product-ish background. I, um, I started as a business analyst at a management consulting firm where I was doing some uh, technology systems like implementations, that kind of stuff. Then I worked at a different consulting firm doing something similar. Then I had a stint in advertising tech business analyst, scrum master, um, did a little bit of product management stuff there. And then most recently, and where I'm at right now, I'm at Warby Parker. Uh, I'm a technical product manager there. Uh, something you might know from product is that it means something different everywhere. And the word technical means something different everywhere. So just to clarify that, uh, I don't touch a line of code. Um, that's not something that I do. But I do manage technical products. So that's one way of, of thinking about my path. Uh, which sounds like, oh, you should definitely have the job that you have. Uh, on the other hand, I have a little bit of a different story where I majored in English. Uh, I did pre-med. Um, I'm not a doctor. Uh, my parents are very aware of that. Um, <laughs> and see, after I left school, I like worked part-time in a rehab center because I was like, maybe I want to be a physical therapist. And then I did that, and I was like, maybe I don't want to be a physical therapist. Uh, I took the MCATs. I did all of that stuff. I had also done a lot of work in special ed when I was in college, so I like worked uh, doing applied behavioral analysis with autism and that kind of stuff. And then I was at a pizzeria Uno's because uh, it's great, and uh, I ran into like an old career counselor that I had in college, and she said, "Hey, I know you're not like really into the consulting or the tech thing because my I had like told her when I was in school, oh like I don't want that like my sister's in it and it looks awful." Um, she said, don't worry about it. Uh, there's this firm that does uh, special education technology systems. And so I gave it a shot. So I worked at a company called Public Consulting Group for a while. Um, and that was sort of my introduction into it. But again, I'm not touching code. Even there, we had engineers. But they were like located totally a different office. And sometimes I'd be writing requirements. But really, not that much technical stuff going on. And then all besides this, um, I also like have a uh, a life where I do a lot of comedy and stuff, which uh, you might have guessed if you laughed and if you didn't. Uh, again, that super hurts. Um, but yeah, I I've, I've, uh, was on a uh, house team at the Upright Citizens Brigade for a couple of years. I did some stuff for Funny or Die. I, uh, was a, I was a creative editor at this startup called Poncho, writing weather forecasts in the voice of a cat. I had all these weird gigs where I was uh, my weirdest one that comes up is I used to be on this tour of New York comedy and they would pick me and my friend up in Union Square on this tour bus and tourists would pay $70 to see me perform for 10 minutes on a moving bus. Uh, and it was really awful and I had gotten paid uh, with, I got a drink and hot dogs every time. And it was just a recurring thing I did for a couple months. So I do have this whole other life, and it's sort of like, oh, that doesn't sound like a technical product manager. But surprise, and I did it. So I'm super psyched about it. But really, the way that I am thinking about this is that my laptop's frozen, so I don't remember. Uh, let me try to handle this for a second. Yeah, so... Just to go over what the goals of today and how I think about them, I really, I really think it's just one goal, and it's the one that's stated, which is understand and address engineering challenges. Um, I put the other two there more for context. So 
the idea of someone non-technical coming in and understanding and addressing engineering challenges, it's sort of a tricky one because I want to say, yes, we should all do this, but we should only do this if the second thing is true, if we're doing it so we can help engineers work more effectively. And same thing goes, we should only really do that if we want to deliver maximum value for the product. So if the engineers on my team want to work on something that is uh, something that I don't find particularly impactful or the metrics are saying it's not particularly impactful, I probably don't want to help them go much faster on that. Um, probably my role is to, to help stop them at that point and gain more alignment and consensus about what we should be doing. Um, and so I want to really separate this talk into two sections. One is how do you work with engineers generally, especially if you don't have an engineering background? And then the second part, really get into some tools that I've used that um, I haven't really seen out there that I think are super interesting and really help you understand value of, of technical things, even if you don't have that background. Um, just by a show of hands, who currently already works in, in product management? Cool. Um, this might be the same question, it might be a different one. Who works day to day with engineers already? Cool, that's a good, we've got a good mix of a crowd here. So some of the things I'm gonna be saying about engineers, I recognize engineering is such a broad term. So there's gonna be some generalities and I'm gonna try not to make them, but I just wanna give that, that caution there. So anyone who's worked with engineers knows that there's eight different types of engineers and they each have 14 different types of challenges and that I'm very much just kidding because that's not a thing. Um, yeah, but I, I say that because I think that there are some really strong narratives around tech and there's all of this like literature and blog posts out there that are maybe titled like the talk, like the talk I'm giving right now, of like you don't have a tech background, here's the crazy secrets. Um, when I think really the way that I think about engineering, the way I think about tech is I'm working with people in a department where I am not the expert um, and that is 100% what I think a product sort of job is. You're, you're not there to necessarily be the expert in everything that everybody does. The same way that I walk into a room of people who do a marketing, I don't really know what they do, but I want to get clear on the kind of value that I can provide. Um, so really, I really want to drive home this point. If you have doubts and hesitations of like, I can't do it, tech is not a thing. Um, I think we have all sorts of crazy origin stories, like questions about people who work in tech of, Oh, they've been coding since they were like three years old, and it's it kind of puts a scary uh, a light on things. Um, and for me, I've been doing it for a couple of years, so obviously I have absolutely no lack of confidence. Uh, I'm totally certain about everything I'm doing. People in the back, uh, note to self: look confident. You can do this. Don't reveal that you still have these doubts, and leave these comments before you start, uh, which is true because otherwise it will be really embarrassing. I am a very, very sensitive boy. Uh, I just put this dumb joke in here just because I've been doing this for a couple of years. I've been working directly with engineers for a couple of years, and all of the things that I'm going to go over are still things that I have to remind myself of. So even if you, you've been doing product management for a while and you walk into the room, I think these are just helpful reminders. So I just want to address some of those myths that we sometimes hear about working with engineers. Uh, engineers don't respect anyone who is non-technical. Um, some of you might be smiling because you're like, oh no, you're wrong, I know that guy. Uh, my argument would be whether that guy is an engineer or not, probably a jerk. Like, no matter what uh, department you put that person in, like, they're going to be that way about whatever their subject matter expertise is. So I would say, as for this myth, just like be a person, like, that's fine. Um, I think as long as you can show your value and knowing what the value you bring is, being able to demonstrate that, um, I think you gain respect and also respecting the work that they do, which is, of course, key. Another uh, myth that we often have about engineers is that they're silent background players. So that, uh, you know, there are a lot of tropes in the media about the, the, the people who work in the basement who don't say a lot and their work is kind of just all running through like the background, which I think is an absolutely crazy thing. Uh, there's this blog I found by this product strategist, uh, Jared Rainier, I same as the pronunciation. Uh, the quote is, many other roles can easily cover it up because their work isn't so visible and isn't so obviously bad when it's bad. A developer is more like an actor than a stagehand. Their work is almost always in the spotlight. Um, I found this to be very true because, you know, as somebody who had done some theater things and been on stage, uh, it 
really, until I saw this quote, I, it really didn't hit me. And I think the risk that you run, if you don't realize that their work is out there, you're going to seriously undermine some of the work that they're doing. Um, and to know that they're putting themselves out there. And the fact is about technology, yeah, there's, there's grades of, of how good it is and not. But at the end of the day, it's, a lot of it is, did it work or didn't? And so um, that's an important uh, thing to respect and really let go of that myth. The next is that engineering work has less to do with emotional or soft skills. Um, I have started many learn to code programs on your own. Uh, and I've done about a day of them because at the end of that day, I am just like rubbing my face uh, because I am emotionally fragile. Uh, I think one thing we should recognize about engineering work is that it is deeply emotional work. It can be deeply frustrating. Again, a lot of times it works or it doesn't. And you know, if I'm doing a really simple class, I'm just doing some basic HTML or CSS. And I'm just like, why isn't the button green? And I'm like freaking out. Uh, engineers, they, they can handle it. They have a good uh, reach on this. And then the last one that I think is probably one that hits me the most and feels the most pervasive is that engineers are magicians and coding is magic. And I, I hear this a lot still in the office, places I've worked where they're like, oh, I don't know how that works. That's all magic to me. Um, which is absolutely true to, to the rest of us. It might look like magic. What it is it's a coding language, it's technology, it's a thing. It's super impressive and it's super great. But I really don't like it when people refer to code as just magic because it gives us this weird excuse to say, great, it's magic. I don't need to understand how it works because I will never understand how it works. And I don't need to understand anything about the components, the architecture, or anything like that. Oh man, I love this guy here. Uh, don't be him. He treats it as magic and runs away. Don't do that. Uh, but he has joy, so that's fine. Um, so again, you really just want to get past the idea that working with engineers is just something completely foreign and different, except that it kind of is uh, in a different way. And that's what I'm going to be covering next. So while working with engineers, uh, and engineers are not sort of different people, their work is different and the nature of the work that they do does have some distinctions. So something that's different. Perfection. Um, I think the type of people oftentimes who are drawn to this kind of work are, are drawn to really making their code perfect. Uh, and what I mean about this is that oftentimes there can be a million ways to do a task when you're, you're coding it up. And one of those ways could be a, uh, a fast uh, way to do it that in the code looks terrible. Um, and then there's another way to do it that is perfect in the code. You show it to any engineer, you're super proud of what you've done. Um, I think something to realize about what's different about engineers is that there is a real community and they're also looking ahead to the future. So if they do something in a really, uh, I don't know, a better word, they do things in, in what is considered on the back end, like a really shitty way, it's uh, either they're going to see it uh, later on and need to work around it or somebody else that they work with is going to look at it later and try. Uh, and I think there's like certain attitudes about that. So there is a real stigma about writing code that, that maybe doesn't look uh, great. Um, uh, what I'll add about this perfection is oftentimes it's, that doesn't mean that we should say, yes, always do things the perfect and the right way, because otherwise that's not, we're not quite delivering on the value that we should be delivering. And so uh, just some tips I have around this, it's just, it's about listening generously. So um, when somebody wants to take longer to do something, uh, really making sure that you're there to listen. Otherwise, they might not even tell you that that's the case. I've seen cases of that where an engineer, uh, I'll hear that there was like two different ways to do it. One, a really fast and dirty way. Um, and then w one way that was maybe slow and really great for scaling later on. But again, if we're looking at the product, if we're not planning on scaling that part of the code, maybe we shouldn't write it great. You know, the same way that uh, if any of us, you know, work with spreadsheets every day and it's like, well, I can either reference that other cell or I can hard code it in. And this is a very rudimentary uh, way to think about it. Um, if I'm only going to use that Excel spreadsheet today and I'm going to remember exactly what that number is about, I'm going to hard code it in and I'll know what it's about. But if I'm going to be using that in like, you know, a couple of months and I know something's going to break because we're changing this thing, it's kind of the same thing, or, or you know, even if I'm writing myself notes and uh, I know that I'm going to look at these notes in an hour, 
Um, yeah, I don't need it to be clear. I don't need it to be perfect. I just need to basically know what it is. But if I know that somebody else is going to be looking at it, well, that's, that's a different story. And so it's important to listen generously and make sure that people can communicate those things to you. Otherwise, they'll, they'll hide. Um, next is pushing on incremental value. I mean, there's just some sort of basic agile principles, and you'll see those come up uh, throughout this. But um, it's really about tying to what can we deliver for the end user. And so the quality of the code, while that doesn't matter that much to us as, as product managers, we need to make sure that that's communicated out and that's sort of a cultural thing with your team. Uh, people want to build things that people use. So that makes sense. And then also the classic sort of framing, the so that. So you know, we want to build this feature so that blank. If you've got an engineer who's working on something and doesn't know what it's for, they're going to care a lot more about having perfect code because to them, the only purpose is that the code works and is good and that it's a beautiful piece of code. But if you say, and you're constantly reinforcing culturally, like we're doing this feature so that these users can uh, click on this page from our mobile app uh, more quickly or, or that our performance is better on this page, then we're all keeping the same goal in mind. And uh, you know, there are fewer confusions about how perfect a piece of code needs to be. So what else is different? Okay. Engineering work has a ton of unknowns and unknown unknowns. So something I forgot to mention is what I actually work on at Warby Parker. Um, so I work on a couple of different teams. We actually have a very unique structure that I'll talk about later where we're in all sorts of different parts of the code base. So while I do have particular areas of focus, I also end up working on features that are all throughout the code. And so um, when I think about unknown and unknown unknowns, I'm thinking about a project that um, a feature somebody on my team had taken on, uh, smartest guy in the room, really smart. The idea was that, um, for people who don't work with glasses every day, I'm trying to think about this, uh, we, when you sell glasses, you have your glasses and then you have the, the case where the glasses are and you have the, uh, the lens cloth. So there's a couple of different pieces of it. Um, our original sort of work order invoice model was that it was assuming that glasses are always coming from the same place as the kits that they're coming with and the lens cloths. And what we wanted to do was just for the purposes of like more, in, uh, better allocation and getting things to customers faster is say, well, we don't always want the glasses coming straight from the lab, uh, with the kits. Cause you know what? The labs maybe aren't always great about how they pack them or maybe we can start putting the cases on at the stores because we have to do some QA on them when they get, come in the stores. And so we want a more flexible system that will allow us to do this. And so we were tasked with, great, go figure out how that thing works. So I uh, put on my execution hat and I talked to my lead engineer and I said, hey, how big of a thing is this? Like, how long does this thing take? And he was like, oh, yeah, this is going to take forever. Um, because apparently that's the nature of code. And I said, what do you, like, you can't tell me forever. And he's like, I don't know, this is probably like a three or four, four month thing. And I was just like, why is this three or four months? And then he's like, well, because of this thing and this thing, and that will probably take like a month. And so I did my trailing pattern and I said, wait, why? Uh, and then we were breaking down the work together and getting into it. And basically the idea is that there's so much that was unknown. Did it take five months? Well, did it take forever? Did not take forever. Did it take five months? No, but the tendency for, can be for engineers to give you a ton of padding because they've been burned before when they tried to, to tell you how something works when it's a total black box. Uh, and so some lessons here. One of them is get small. The only way to eliminate uncertainty is to break it down into smaller uncertain parts. And when you go from there, as people start to break down the task into parts that are uncertain, um, I always like to ask, like, how confident do you feel about that? How big of an unknown is that? Because any big unknowns can always be broken down to smaller unknowns. Uh, next, shipping is learning. So the way that we did this was not by setting, to, setting up some giant infrastructure project to figure out how an order could flow through the system. The, problem, the reason why this was so complicated is because when we change our fundamental way that an order goes through the system from the way that we request that a lab does it to the way it flows back uh, through payments and orders and all of this uh, complicated financial uh, compliance stuff, is that when you touch any part of that, a lot of it can break. And so what we did... Um, was we just shipped as much as we could and we did it silently. So for example, um, we had, uh, I'll just call it 
uh, structure one of this idea of a work order fulfillment request. We had that going and that was the existing one. And then we silently set up a second one that did the exact same thing, but it didn't actually do anything. It would just log the errors when they came. So that way we would just know when we're breaking everything, um, knowing what you break. Because the big unknowns in this project is like, I, can, I think I know how to make the change, but I'm pretty sure we're going to break the world. And uh, the answer wasn't that we broke the world, but we broke a lot more. And the only way that we got rid of some of those unknowns is to actually ship it and see those. Uh, and the last is sort of checking for blockers. So anybody who's done project management, done Scrum, anything like that, uh, this is a common thing. And a question that you might find yourself always asking is, hey, what's blocking you today? And the answer that at least I always get is nothing. And then uh, I ask, great, so what's taking you longer than you thought? Uh, and that has a totally different answer. And uh, other questions like, um, hey, what are you still waiting on from somebody? Hey, uh, uh, even just checking retroactively of like, hey, what was your goal for yesterday and why didn't you meet it? Again, checking for blockers without checking for blockers, I think we're all sort of getting so used to the language of like, what's a blocker that people don't think about it. So those are important lessons. Oh, this is fun. Here we go. Okay, last thing that's different, and this is something that I know resonates with me because I'm somebody who likes doing creative things. Um, a lot of people tend to think of engineers as, as sort of these hard and fast, like math and science, types, uh, when really coding is a deeply emotional, creative process. And so um, some people might have heard of the concept of maker versus manager. Uh, this is the idea that there are maker schedules and there are manager schedules. And a maker schedule is one where you need big blocks of time to do things. So um, I know when I try to do, you know, maybe I'm writing a sketch for something, um, maybe I can hop on the train, maybe I might have 20 minutes, half hour there. I'm not gonna get anything done in 20 minutes, a half hour, because it takes a while just to get into it, know what I'm supposed to be writing. Maybe I could like punch up some jokes, write a quick line, but like the first 15 minutes, I'm just reading what I already wrote. So that doesn't get me anywhere. And so if I have blocks of 15 minutes throughout the day or a half hour throughout the day, I'm gonna get nothing done. Manager schedule, um, that's what I'm much more used to at work, which is I've got meetings throughout the day. So maybe between one meeting and another, I might have 20, 30 minutes there. As a manager, I can just write emails. Like that's part of my job. I can go stop by someone's desk. I can communicate those things. I can get those done. And so being really attentive to the schedule and knowing that, hey, engineers, they are going to have their own style. And maybe I shouldn't set up a meeting and then there's an hour and then another meeting. Anytime you can block out uh, big groups, of, big blocks of time, that's generally helpful. Um, similarly, respecting working styles. So again, this all comes with trust and that's kind of thing. But you know, I uh, work with people who have an adjusted schedule, who don't come in until noon because they're just more productive. And uh, the less we can force uh, people into working in the way that maybe managers are used to working, uh, the harder it's going to be. And the last, uh, like with creatives, encourage shipping. So I've been writing a uh, half hour show for a couple of, oh, it's going to be a year soon um, because it has no deadline. Um, I just submitted it like last two, two or three weeks ago. Um, but when I have things with deadlines, I used to write for a monthly show every day, really great. Um, just encourage shipping because uh, really you wanna make those constraints to your friends. So um, pushing on what is shippable so that you can learn better and you can make things better. Uh, these are all parts that are creative and, and you, know, you might hear some engineers might push back and say, no, coding's like creative, like you can't put, it's gonna take as long as it's gonna take. Uh, that's just flatly not true. Um, I, I think an interesting question that sometimes comes up is, uh, I'll be talking about a piece of work and someone will say, oh, uh, this will probably take like seven or eight days. I think we'll probably do it like this. And I'll say, great. What if we were in a world where you only had three days? How would you do it? Of course, with it, the, um, the idea of like, you have more than three days, but like, let's pretend you only have three days. How would you ship this thing out? So using those constraints are really important. So we've talked a lot about how to work better with engineers. We haven't really gotten to, to talking about how do I understand engineering challenges better. And I think the underlying thing here is that you're talking to them and you're building trust and you are in a space where they feel like they can talk to you and you can talk to them. And so that's all embedded in here. Um, what I also wanna add is understanding engineering challenges. When someone's having trouble with a piece of code, you probably don't need to help, slash, you're probably really bad at it. Uh, if you're in this room, unless you're just somebody who does have a coding background, 
you're definitely not good at it. But those are not exactly uh, the things that I want to talk about. I want to talk about value. So it's important to understand the challenges, not to help them code, because obviously we don't, that's not the jobs that we're doing, but we care about the value that that code delivers. And so understanding how the challenges relate to the value, I think, is the sweet spot of where you need to be in terms of understanding engineering. And it all depends what perspective you're coming from. The one that I sort of push, because it's a flaw of, of mine, is that I tend to go too high. And so a lot of the lessons that I've learned for myself is like drill down, ask more questions, need, like learn more about the components. I also have coworkers who have the same job who their problem is like, oh, like maybe back up against back up uh, in terms of like getting too much into how their different components work. But at the end of the day, it's all about caring about value. So that said, this is the sort of the second part of this talk which is how do you understand the connection between engineering challenges and the value, especially when you don't have that technical background and there, there are very highly technical situations. So um, I wanna tell you about one challenge that I had. Uh, I came to Warby Parker two years ago, uh, deeply insecure, uh, just as insecure as now about how, versa, excuse me, how much I needed to know about um, technology. And one of the teams that was given to me was one for development infrastructure. So what are the tools that developers use to get their work done? So we're talking about uh, a lot of Amazon tooling, we're talking about uh, ad hoc environments and staging and all of these things I didn't know anything about. Um, I was lucky the first couple of months because the team is one person and that person was being uh, lent over to the operations team because they were working on a big infrastructure project. And if anyone's worked on a big infrastructure project, uh, that's about maybe you're switching over to Amazon or maybe you're changing the way that we deploy things. Uh, it's oftentimes a big giant mess and, and because when you're playing with infrastructure, you're changing so many things, there's a lot of unknowns and a lot of unintended consequences. But I was super psyched because he wasn't under me and so I didn't worry about my product. And so what my product was and still is, is actually the developer experience. Um, uh, on a technical level, it's like a whole different kind of com uh, components around our deploy process, around how to spin up a new environment, that kind of stuff, but at the end of the day, it's development process. And so what had happened was, after about two months of him being on that team, uh, and they used him, uh, he came back to my team, and everything broke, because that's what stuff does. Um, my measure and my metrics of whether we were succeeding or not is basically, uh, I saw this in a BuzzFeed article and I actually in a meeting with them, we, we talked about this metric. Um, how much do you want to throw your laptop out the window? Uh, so with engineers, you're just, you're just trying to get your work done, but your environment isn't working. And so you know your code is great, but the thing that my team helped build for you so that you can actually deploy that code is not working. You want to throw that out. Uh, and so our more hard metric versus the, uh, the laptop one is number of hours blocked. Um, measuring velocity is always like a tricky thing, so we're sort of measuring reverse velocity. How much did our development environments block you from doing what you needed to do? And all of our numbers were really bad because something was breaking every day because the more you change things on your, prodding, your prod environment, the more things break on your development environments. All sorts of different technical things were wrong. And I had no idea what to do because I am not the customer. I also don't understand the customer. The customer in this case is the development staff. Um, they're the regular teams. And on top of that, they don't want to talk to me um, because they're just trying to get their work out. They just want their thing to work. What happened oftentimes would be that some of them would work around it and not tell me how they did it or not tell my team how they did it. And so there was lots of communication challenges. And so we were in a really bad spot, and I, as somebody who was very uh, nervous about my technical skills, was nervous, and I didn't know what to do. And so I looked around to the rest of the organization, and I saw, oh, there you go, uh, yeah, technical problems. And I was like, oh, I can't help because I'm the guy who gets paid in hot dogs, and I love magic, and I used to write weather forecasts for a living. Like, I can't handle this, and that was just the wrong way to look at it. Uh, so I looked around the organization. I found a really tool, a cool tool I want to talk about. It's called the Warbles process. Warbles after Warby Parker. Um, it's a prioritization system that we use across the company. And the, the history and the basics of the uh, 
the Werbels process is, and uh, I wouldn't be surprised if, if anybody's heard this before from different departments, wherever they work, I just want a tech team who's going to work on my stuff. Like, can we just have like an engineer who works on the marketing team, an engineer who works on the supply chain team, so that way we can work, and, and a lot of organizations work that way. Um, Warby Parker does not work that way. Uh, we try to keep things lean. Uh, we try to make do of what we have. And so our tech team, when this I, whole idea started, we were experiencing these problems, low stakeholder satisfaction, uh, low levels of happiness from engineers because they felt like they were getting pulled all over the place. And so we came up with a process that was first called initiatives. And the idea here is that each department head makes a pitch about why they should have a tech team uh, work on their project for a quarter. And then they make that pitch, they do it to the CEOs and other high-level managers, and then those CEOs, high-level managers, they say, great, uh, customer experience team, you're going to get a tech team to work for you, uh, supply chain, you're going to get a tech team to work for you, uh, finance team, you get a tech team to work for you, and they would have these big backlogs for the tech team to handle. And what would happen is that the tech team would pick up these features to do, and maybe we'd make it to you know two and a half months into the quarter and have... Two, uh, two weeks left. And then we look at the rest of the backlog and they'd be filled with things like either things that were way too big to even start because they would take more than two weeks or they'd be uh, filled with lots of small things that have no impact. And so we found that a lot of the tech team's time was being uh, spent not in great ways. And so the other idea was to go with the idea of what we called the Warbles process. Oops. Oh, my slides got out of order. That's fine. Let's just find it. Yeah, the, uh, the core values behind the Warbles process, transparency, data slash metrics, coll conversation, collaboration, trust, uh, excuse me, conversation, collaboration, and trust. And really, these all go together to actually tell you what this process is. Um, there's also a great article. Actually, there's a couple of pieces out there. Uh, there's one in Quartz most recently about this process. It's about how the company prioritizes things. As people who are interested in product, I, I highly recommend looking into it because it's, it's fascinating. Um, here's the idea. Anybody in the company, uh, it's a big democratized system, can submit an idea for work, create a ticket, can request anything that they want. So somebody on our customer experience team might say, oh, we need a better way to track when somebody calls. We want that stored in this you know, uh, part of our CRM. Uh, or someone from supply chain says, oh, I really want this to be faster. They request that idea. That idea comes to somebody in tech. We just review it and vet it. Well, we, when I say reviewing and vetting, we're really just making sure, hey, does this have enough information here so that everybody in the company knows what this thing is? Then we, uh, we put it into, we have a Warbles app, and it displays every request that somebody in the company has made. Um, and then there are a certain level uh, of staff that are voters. They're usually high-level managers in the company. And they have a set number of votes. And so they each have 10 votes. And then what, that, what happens there is you see what things rise to the top. Everything's sorted by the number of votes. So you can see what's important to the whole company, regardless of department. So the top request might be something from supply chain. It might be from finance. It might be from any other, uh, any other department. And then that whole giant list, there's 100 plus things on it right now. That's our backlog for the tech teams. And the tech teams can each pick up work from that list. And our incentive for doing these and incentive, our supposed incentive for completing the work is that we earn those fictional points that we call warbles. And then at the end of the quarter, we go out to a nice dinner. Um, I say that that's supposedly our incentive because if your only incentive is actually to like go to a nice dinner, like this probably won't work. Um, some of the underlying things here, like I said, it's trust. Um, and trusting that the tech teams are going to pick on things that are important to the rest of the company. So this was actually a huge uh, cultural piece for us, too. And the whole thing that's super important about this, the voting itself, yeah, it's, it's important. It's great for visibility, and everybody knows what everybody's working on. But the important part is that we're having a company-wide conversation constantly about what we should be working on. And so if somebody from supply chain sees that my team isn't picking up their ticket, they know that we're not picking it up because everybody's deemed that there's a higher priority. And so maybe if their, their work got more uh, votes on it, then maybe we would pick it up. Um, some people and some of our initial concerns were, well, what happens if, uh, 
what happens if people start lobbying for votes? They just send out big emails to everybody who's a voter and says, hey, I need, I need someone to pick up this ticket. Um, can, can everybody vote on this? And we're very afraid of that happening. And that happens all the time. And it's actually really great because, I mean, they, they might be saying, yeah, vote on this thing. But the implicit understanding is, hey, if you think this thing is important, can you show that you think it's important too? Um, and so we always have a conversation about what's important and what's not. Also allows us to be more iterative because we are in a position where instead of giving a tech team completely to our uh, finance team for a quarter, um, we might work on something, the most important thing from finance, and then we see the votes change. And once we're done with that piece of work, we see that there's another thing that's super important that's coming up from a different department. And so we don't have entire giant blocks of time where departments aren't getting uh, any sort of support, except in the instance of, you know, that they don't have any requests or their requests actually aren't that valuable. Is, is everyone's votes like counted the same or do some like greater weight for their vote? Yeah, um, I'll answer this question. For the other questions, we'll, we'll try to group them in the end because the Warbles thing tends to get a, a ton of questions. Um, votes are weighted mostly the same. Uh, the only voters that do not have the same amount of sway are managers in tech. And that's because um, the idea being that managers in tech uh, already have a really strong influence on what people are going to pick up. So, and that, and there's like, there's a greater number of managers in tech. So there is some math around it. Um, I am going to hold questions for the end, but this is what we do company wide. There's a con constant conversation. We never have situations anymore. Well, I shouldn't say that. There are many fewer conversations where every manager in the company doesn't know what everybody else, everybody knows what everybody else is working for, uh, excuse me, working on and what we're each pushing for. And so it, it really actually provides a sense of unity for what we think we're doing as a company, which is uh, really important. Um, we made a very MVP app for it, minimum viable product. I took out some sensitive information in here, but basically we've got size. So how big we think this piece of work is, Everybody's also incentivized to create the smallest pieces of work possible. Again, it's much more iterative that way um, because they know that uh, if the incentive is warbles, well, if I can get 100 warbles for doing a ticket that's an extra small, I'm going to pick that over a ticket that's 100 warbles for uh, that's actually a size medium. So everybody's incentivized to cut down the size of their tickets. And doing that would mean that they're isolating the tickets that they're creating into the pieces of value they actually want from it. So, you know, if we have an internal system uh, where somebody requests, hey, I want an easier way to, I don't know, um, input customer information here, they're going to get much, much more bare bones about what needs to be delivered rather than sort of debate uh, around like, oh, here's how it should look and it should do these five other things. When if the value is you just need to add the customer faster, we want to find the fastest way to do it. And so it, it does help us to be more iterative that way. Again, we went incredibly MVP on this. So did we build a new Warbles app? Nope. I've got a Google Sheet. And the Google Sheet has links to JIRA, uh, SysDev Infrastructure. That's SDI here. It's got a count of the things. Um, it's talking about the environment, the systems that we have, uh, what kind of impact, the status. We have little votes. It's just a little drop down. You don't need to build an app to do this. This is It's really just a glorified, uh, it's not even a glorified spreadsheet. It's just a spreadsheet. If you look at these requests, they sound like jargon if you're not entirely familiar with some of the infrastructure tools that we're using. Um, the way that I use this is people would put in requests. So I gave everybody on tech votes. And I said, hey, um, you use these environments. Tell me what we should do. Here are all the things in the backlog. So I populated it with like 10 or 15 things. Um, and the person who's on my team, the engineer, he, the problem wasn't that he wasn't doing a good job at what he was given. He didn't know what to work on because out of the 15 things, he does infrastructure. He doesn't have a, a lot of insight about what the end user actually wants. And so this is just kind of a way of constantly polling your users. Um, and so what I did is I gave them all votes. I said, hey, here's the 10 things or 15 things that, that we have in our backlog. You tell me with your votes what's important. Also, you can submit any ideas at any point. And then as they, they tell me what they want, as they submit things, I get to have the conversation. I get to say, OK, why do you want this thing? What's it going to improve? What's going to be different about the developer's life at the end of the day? You know, uh, Really looking at our metrics for developer experience. How is this going to affect the number of hours we're blocked? 
Um, a crazy thing and a conversation I've had many times is, I don't know, I can't, I can't tell you how much faster it's going to make us. It's going to make us better. Um, just use proxies. I, there's always that con con constant conversation in metrics of like, do we use bad metrics or do we use no metrics? I fall on the side of using, we'll call them the best metrics we have available. Um, because that at least opens up the conversation for someone to say like, oh, you said that that's going to decrease deploy time by, you know, 20%. I actually don't think that's true. I think it's by 10% or I think it's a smaller number. Until you start putting wrong answers out there, people are not going to, uh, to give you the right answers. And so I got to have a lot of conversations for people who are submitting things. And then for the things at the top, I knew, hey, I should be focusing my energy on understanding what these things are. So out of the possible world, when you're working with engineers and the million different things you can understand, a process like this gives you a structure to have the right conversations and to focus the conversations on the things that everybody has agreed, hey, we think these are the most important. Um, again, uh, an important part of this is trust that people are going to use their votes correctly. And then also for the engineer on my team who's picking up these tickets, I trust that he's not going to ignore the thing that's at the top just because he doesn't like it. He knows that it's important and I trust that he's going to pick it, but nobody's forcing him to do it. Um, we do end up in situations both in this smaller warbles process and the larger warbles process where something does get voted up really highly. So it's really clear to everybody that this is a priority and nobody picks it up. And that, again, allows us to have the conversation of, hey, we all said this is important. Why aren't we doing it? And a great thing is an engineer can pipe up and say, oh, because it doesn't make sense to do that part before we do this part. And those are just conversations you don't have unless you're constantly having that conversation. Um, some lessons I learned in this. Uh, communication is key. It's, it can be exhausting. It's a lot of upkeep. It's a lot of engagement. For this conversation to work, people have to be to know why you're doing it. And so here's like a sample email I'll send is if we pick up a piece of work and so people get their votes back because there's a limited number of votes, I'll email those people and say, hey, we just picked up that ticket. You have some votes back, so you can go place them on some other things. Every week I send out an update that was like, hey, we added these new tickets. Or, hey, does anyone know why this one is getting a lot uh, higher than that one? Um, I try to focus it around calls to action. So it's like, well, we're picking up a new ticket next Wednesday. Can you guys put some votes on? Because I don't know what's important to all of you. Um, always sending out sort of a scorecard every month of our metrics, uh, knowing why we're doing it. Um, Try not to put too much detail, but you can see in general, it's gone down the number of hours we've had locked over the couple, uh, past couple of months. And so this process has been really helpful. Um, again, I'm, I'm not saying that I understand the engineering challenges. I don't understand how to fix a thing, but I do understand the relationship between why we should do certain things uh, versus other things. Because the question is not just what should we do, what should we not do, and, and when. So some of the when I scaled it down, some of the things that were different votes are only at the beginning of the conversation. It's kind of a weird way to lull people into talking to you about some of these important things. Um, votes, they're not a substitute for critical thinking. We're talking about product here. And uh, I think that, you know, uh, product manager is responsible for ex experience at the end of the day. So you shouldn't take people's blind word um, or their blind votes about it. Uh, you want to engage your users in a meaningful way. And scarcity helps prioritization. The, First problem I had when I first launched this thing was that I gave everybody 10 votes because that's what we were doing in the larger warbles process. Um, when I gave everybody 10 votes, they used five of them and then I couldn't tell what was a priority or not and people didn't feel a need to vote when uh, we would pick up tickets and they would get votes back. So I limited it down to four. Um, yeah, and really I wanted to get to some questions. So some final thoughts. A crazy thought, engineers are people. Whoa, you are people and you should be people together. Uh, second, coding's not magic, so push yourself for more understanding. Um, and then third, set up the structures uh, needed to understand the values so you can bring them. I'm not saying that Warbles is a solution for everybody. If you can find another way, and there are definitely other ways to have these conversations and to do it in an efficient way, um, I completely encourage them because it, it's been a really great tool in informing how we should make decisions. Uh, and then the last thing, because I know that there's going to be some networking and stuff after this, just a, a, a little prompt. If you've thought of applications for this and you want to talk to somebody about it or neighbor, like I, I totally encourage people to do that. Um, with that said, that's that's sort of the end of what I prepared. And so, uh, yeah, we'll take the time for questions. Yep. Um, so to clarify, when you're talking about 
product and, and the Warbles process, yeah. the product that you're discussing is, is not like Warby Parker's product, but is the yeah. actual development process. Yeah, I should. Yep, I should specify. That's a, that's a great point. Um, it can even get confusing very internally. When I talk about product at Warby Parker, I'm talking about the technical products. That's where my title, technical product manager, comes from. Um, it's not referring to the glasses themselves. Uh, it's all of our internal systems. We built our own sort of little ERP that does everything that we need it to do. So, yeah. Um, and then my second question was basically just like a lot of the things that I saw, like the examples I saw that had level of ups, um, effort estimated. How do you, most of it was about like nature of building yeah. um, type things. How do you factor critical bumps into that equation? Yeah. So do you have to wait if like something is really broken, do you have to wait for everything to go? Yeah, that's a good question. I'll, I'll repeat it for people in the back. So the question came up of all of these seem like really feature-based, all of the things that we're voting on. Um, what happens when there's a bug? Uh, how do you handle that? Does it have to go through the warbles process? Because as you can imagine, there might be some overhead if the site goes down or something you know, breaks, you don't want to go through that process. Um, this prioritization process for warbles is something we do exclusively for feature development, um, sorting out bugs and critical, critical bugs. We've got an ops team that takes care of that. So they have their own prioritization that I don't know a, a lot about, but yeah. Um, so for people who didn't hear, and, and just to make sure I got the question right, the teams that pick up these Warbles tickets, are they just infrastructure, are they just like software engineers in the classical sense, or are they also infrastructure? Yes. Uh, for the feature building Warbles process that we use company-wide, um, it's software engineers and it is technical product managers, and then we have a couple of teams that also have uh, UX and uh, designers on them. Um, and then as for the mini warbles process, uh, it's just an infrastructure engineer because they're all they're mostly infrastructure problems. Right. Okay. And uh, the second question was uh, how do you handle like the different projects where you have one department is bigger than some of the other departments? How do you handle the portfolio? Yeah, uh, the question is how do you handle it when you know how do you handle the distribution of votes because you might have some departments that are bigger and so do you give the bigger department more votes because that might tip things off? Uh, and my short answer is, I don't know. And <laughs> we're figuring it out. Um, our, our CEOs and, and management sort of helps figure out how many votes go to each department and what level and what person. The main criteria that I know they look at is, does this person have an overall view of where we're trying to go as a company? Because the whole spirit of this is uh, for the company, how do we, uh, how do we move forward in, in a cohesive direction? And so it's probably at least the thought is votes are better when they're people who have a, a good view of what's going on everywhere in the company rather than what's just happening you know, within their immediate vicinity. Yeah. Yep. Um, so you mentioned that all engineers like, would put on some padding for um, to the work. So as a product manager, what are some things that you've done to like, minimize that? that yeah. Um, uh, in case anybody didn't hear, how do you minimize the, the problem of padding things? Um, I think it's a cultural thing. Uh, so there's not a lot I can do on the larger culture. Luckily, Warby has like a great culture where people feel OK about being honest. And I've had people who are come, came from much larger organizations that were much more strict about timeline. And they keep telling me, hey, make sure you change the size of the ticket, because I looked at the thing. And make sure you tell them. And we've got, we've got uh, an atmosphere overall that's like, hey, don't worry about it. Like, it's fine. Like, just tell me why, because if the work is going to take what it's going to take, like let's just make sure that that's correct, and we can tell people. And um, you, you know, the way that you get people hiding it is like when you, when you uh, try to hold them accountable for unknowns. And so, I think on a larger scale, it's sort of like a larger cultural thing. On a smaller scale, I think it's just building trust with your engineers. Um, yeah, I mean, I, and it's it's sort of like a stated value that we would rather miss aggressive timelines, then um, make it to padded timelines. Are you ever part of the hiring process for engineers? Yes, yeah. What type of questions do you ask and what do you look for? Yeah, um, 
When we're hiring engineers, uh, I've obviously never been the hiring manager for an engineer because I'm, I'm not an engineer, but we always involve somebody who's in a technical product manager role because you know we work with engineers really closely. Um, I think what we look for, uh, especially I'm not gauging technical skill. I personally, I like to ask them about something technical on their resume and see how good they are at explaining it to me because if we're going to be having that conversation, I want to know that they can handle it. Um, I want to know how good they are at feedback because again, it's a communication, it's a cultural thing. We are super heavy uh, feedback culture and so I want to make sure that they can both give feedback and uh, also take feedback. So I usually ask some questions around that. And then uh, what's the other main thing I check for? Um, just communication skills in general because we are not an organization where tech is sort of siloed out to one place and that engineers never talk to business stakeholders. We're very much a culture where there's a lot of collaboration there. And so uh, I always check for that kind of stuff. Yep. Um, I have two related questions. So can you explain the Warbles like points thing? Is that like the more complex it is or the more longer it takes to do? That's like the more war like Warbles? Yes. I'm confused about that. Uh, so Warbles is our, it's just our, our word for points. So every, uh, this is, <laughs> Always like complicated. So every voter gets 10 votes, so they can vote on 10 different tickets at any point, and each one of those votes is five warbles, five points. So um, everybody's got about 50 points worth of, of voting. Got it. So the warbles is actually just like determination of like voting and like yeah. Okay, got it. It's our best proxy for strategic value. Got it. Yeah. Um, and then the uh, other related question was, oh, how do the engineers pick? What to work on? Like, can they just sort of pick whatever? Like, they could pick something that doesn't have a lot of warbles at all. Yeah, and this is this is a part that people uh, get a little taken aback by. Uh, uh, engineers can absolutely pick anything they want um, because they are entrusted to do so. And at the same time, when you pick whatever you want, you should just explain why you did it. Um, one of the guiding principles, uh, our CTO says it all the time: people who are closest to, to the work know best what they should be working on. And so. You know, you probably don't want a person who's never worked with um, that particular part of the code base to take on the highest priority ticket in the company because, well, they just maybe are not going to deliver it as fast as somebody who's maybe more experienced. With that said, we have absolutely had times where something is way at the top and nobody picks it, and then we have the conversation of why is nobody picking it, and if there's not a good reason other than like, ooh, it looks sticky, um, then yeah, there have been very few instances less than like I can count on a hand where our like director had to say, okay, so somebody pick this up, just do it. But yeah, it comes up. Yep. Um, when you say the resource plan, like. Yeah, that's set up by our director of how the teams are made up. So some teams are much more cross-functional and so they're equipped with UX and design and that kind of stuff. And some teams are uh, much more back-end and so we don't have those resources. And typically the teams that already have those resources and have those people are the ones to pick up more of the front-end tickets and that kind of stuff. So, um, and then something I'll also add in terms of freedom, you can choose to work on whatever you wanna work on. If you're on a team that doesn't have those resources, you can always say, I want to go work on that team, and that team does have those resources, so I want to work with a UX person, so we do that. And that's actually how it kind of got started. Yeah. Yep. So I understand how this process works when your customer is an internal employee, but can this be applied when your customer is the outside world, and how would you go about clarifying? Yeah, um, I don't know. That's an interesting question. Um, I think that speaking totally off the cuff on, about it, I think my immediate reaction would be how do you how do you engage and incentivize your users? And I guess it depends on what the product is. Um, when I try to think about our products, like the mobile app, and I work on the mobile app. You know, uh, would our mobile app users care to vote on features and care to submit ideas? Um, maybe. I, I yeah. I don't have a good answer, sorry. How does it come from? Is it a continuous process like scoring on features coming in and going, or is that something like it's pretty like 
Yeah, it does make it a little bit more difficult to do a typical scrum kind of structure because we might finish something and then need to move on to another piece of work and it might be in the middle of a sprint or something like that. So it, it is continuous and it does make some of those structures more challenging. Um, like I said, I'm looking at it every day and in my head I'm like, oh, so-and-so, they're finishing their, their feature on Tuesday, so I need to prep something for them for Wednesday. The way I usually go about it, I send them two or three that I just know them well enough where I'd like, I think, hey, I think these are things that you'd be interested in. And then they tell me what they want to work on and then I go through some more of the uh, requirements gathering, analysis, that kind of stuff, and make sure that it's ready by the time they need to get to it. Um, Every team does it differently. It's sort of a theme of ours is independence and trust. And so my team does it differently than other teams. The way I do it is we've got, it's a weekly planning. It's kind of a sprint planning, not really. And I just, I say, hey, where do you want to be next week when I ask this question again? Like, you know, and then I check in on the goals from the last week, blockers, that kind of stuff. Treat it like sprint planning, but sort of adjusted because everybody's on a different time frame and the teams are, are a little bit more confusing, but um, it works. I'm sorry, uh, besides this, what other? Yeah, um, really this is our main prioritization method. Um, uh, I mean, I can't think of any other formal tools. We use, we use a ton of agile tools. We sort of like to say we're lowercase agile rather than uppercase agile. So um, this is not a development methodology, but uh, you know the way we work is probably closer to like Kanban or something like that. Uh, Oh yeah, we use Jira. Uh, we use Jira, we use Trello. Again, it kind of varies by team. We're, we're all over the place. Yep. Um, we use HipChat within Jira, yeah. And each of these features has their own uh, HipChat room where we talk about the feature. How useful is it HipChat versus Personally, I, so the question is, how much do you use Jira versus HipChat? for commenting on tickets and stuff. I much prefer HipChat because it's much more real time. It's easier to see what's going on. It's easier to sort of tag people, but yeah. Um, that and I mean a big part of this is like, if I see the entire conversation happening in JIRA, I know I should probably be talking to somebody in person. Um, it means it's probably super unproductive if we've got a long JIRA chain going. And we have the luxury of, of all of We've got two corporate offices, um, but most of the people who are working on tickets are all in one place, so it's, it's nice. Yeah. All right, I think that is it. Thanks, everyone. Thank